Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Ocean Expert Exchange. Scientists in every Florida school and in Jury Foundation are so excited to have you join us again for this exciting semester of live stream webinars with ocean scientists. In this monthly series, we dive into all things marine science and explore what's happening in the field, interest, interesting careers and more. And today we're going to be speaking with Nate Formel of Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. Nate will be talking to us about how he's been using open source movement to expand and improve um, on the tools for marine research. But first, we'd like to tell you a little bit about our program. The Scientist in Every Florida School program is a free program housed within the Thompson Earth Systems Institute at the University of Florida. The mission of CEFS is to engage Florida K-12 students and teachers in cutting edge research by providing science role models like today uh, and ins hopefully inspire future stewards of our planet. As for our partner, Angeri Foundation, this is a nonprofit headquartered in West Palm Beach, Florida. The foundation supports and promotes marine science research and education and many of the foundation's uh, primary initiatives involve the 65 foot research vessel RVN Jari. In case you've missed any of the information uh, in today's previous slides, we'd like to remind you that you can submit your questions for our scientists by typing them in the chat box. We'll also provide a survey at the end of today's presentation uh, so that you can get your chance to get some cool swag. So be sure to take part in that this um, the end of the program. At this time, I'd like to go ahead and introduce to you Nate Formel. He's going to tell us a little bit about himself, about the work and that he does and its significance. Nate, we're going to go ahead and turn things right over to you at this time. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, I will try to keep my fingers crossed and try to execute the sharing of my screen perfectly. Let's see how it goes. Okay, you guys should see engineering solutions for coral reef research. Can anyone confirm that for me? Yep, looks great. Awesome. Um, so thank you all for joining my talk today. Uh, as Stephanie said, my name is Nate Formell, and I'm a marine biologist working at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. Um, today, I'm going to start off by giving you a little bit of a background of where I came from and, and how I got here. Um, and then I'd like to talk to you a little bit about the maker movement and open source technology and design and how I've used that to, to further the research projects that I've been involved in. Um, I'll introduce you to a tool that I helped design and build, which we actually deployed uh, with Anjari on the research vessel for some of its first applications. And finally, I'll run through some of the other open source tools I've helped design and give you guys some resources that you can use if you want to pursue some of these designing efforts yourself. So, not the next slide yet. There we go. Um, I started my marine science career at Northeastern University in Boston. I've, I've always enjoyed the ocean my whole life. I was playing in and around it. But at Northeastern and their marine science program is where I really decided to make a career out of this. Uh, I got my bachelor's degree there, and then a few years later, I attended University of Miami's Rosenstiel School, where I got my master's degree. Um, through both of those programs and in between them, I took advantage of all the opportunities I could to gain experience in marine research. Uh, I wanted to identify what I wanted to pursue for my education. Um, through these efforts, I got to travel all over the country and around the world volunteering. Occasionally, I got paid um, while I was assisting with other people's research. Coral became kind of a common theme throughout my experience, and I enjoyed it. So when I attended UM for my master's, I focused on coral research and restoration. But for the last five years, I've worked at NOAA's Atlantic Oceanographic and Meteorological Lab in Miami. I'm just going to call that AOML from now on. And there we were studying how ocean acidification is impacting coral reefs and looking at ways to improve coral restoration efforts. Uh, at the end of August, I left Miami to start a job here at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, which I'm only going to call HUI from now on in a lab that studies coral reefs, but also other fishes and vertebrates, marine mammals, reptiles, all under the common umbrella of bioacoustics research. So that's how I started and how I got to where I am on this very day. Um, but I'm gonna switch tracks now and introduce a different topic. So some of you may know, maybe not, but makers as a designation are any independent inventors, designers, people who like to tinker, they can be considered makers. And the maker movement is made up of these people and they're all connected. We are all connected across the world by the internet. And there's creation and sharing of these designs. And the kind of work being done was normally relegated to people who are engineers or professional designers, but things have been changing with some resources that have been changing for us. So 
namely there are three big things that have changed. One of them is the availability of relatively inexpensive production technologies like desktop 3D printers, CNC's, laser cutters. All of those machines make it easier to automate your production system so you can actually produce a product without being a large business or a corporation. The second thing that became available was inexpensive but powerful microcontrollers and environmental sensors. Um, having access to those things gave makers capabilities that they didn't have before, uh, whether it's because they were unavailable or that they were just too expensive for somebody to buy as a, as a small scale project. Uh, a good example of that is where the arrow is pointing right here. Um, it's a 3.5 microcontroller from Teensy. It's about the size of a stick of gum and it's essentially a simplified computer. It can control a huge variety of tasks and it only costs about $30. So that's awesome. We use it in almost all the automated tools we designed at AOML. Uh, the last thing that really helps has helped the maker movement take off is the idea of open source, where basically you wanna level the playing field for everybody and give them access to software, hardware designs, um, whatever they might need to create these things, to, to make these things. Um, so if you have the internet, you can access open source learning through online tutorials, forums, and there's a whole community of these makers and users of the hardware and software that can give you updates and provide feedback. And that is really invaluable. If you have ever tried to fix something at home and turn to Google to figure out how to unclog the sink, um, same idea, except instead you're like, how do I make this microcontroller control my robot? Um, without that resource, I don't think a team of marine biologists at AML would have been able to sidestep into this engineering field without actually having any background in it. So a really, really useful feature of, of making the maker movement take off. Um, getting back to the coral, because I think that's what people like to see pictures of. Um, the coral program at AML studies coral reefs and how they're being affected by ocean acidification. Uh, when we're doing that, we use visual surveys, like in the first two pictures on the left. Um, but we also take water samples and take samples of coral skeletons to look at how, how uh, things have changed over time. That picture on the right with all the bubbles is actually a coral core being taken from the reef to look at coral over, over hundreds of years and how it's calcified and grown. Um, the data we gather can help us determine what's behind changes in the reef growth or erosion so that we can better understand the process and then help policymakers and resource managers make more informed decisions. So, Examining carbon and chemistry and water samples fit, taken from the reef site is, is really informative way to know what's going on. And it's a major part of our work, but it's surprisingly difficult. It's just collecting water, right? And that's, that's true. Um, here's a shot of me securing water samples at one of our coral program study sites in the Caribbean. Uh, the water needs to be collected from the actual reef, not just from the surface. So it requires us to be either snorkeling or diving on site. Each sample that we take is a snapshot of the carbon and chemistry. Um, at that location, at that time. And carbonate chemistry gives us an idea of how conditions are for coral reefs to grow. Uh, but the thing about the ocean is, especially coral reefs, is it's really dynamic. It's always changing. Water movement is going everywhere. And so the best science is the science that doesn't take just one sample of water, but it takes a series of samples, maybe over an entire site. And then even better, if you can take a temporal sample where you take one at 1 p.m. and 4 p.m. and 7 p.m. and you have it going, over a period of time so you can capture some of those changes that happen over time. But what that means is the best science you can do is gonna require a lot of water samples and they're gonna stack up quick and it's gonna require a lot of diving, a lot of logistics, maybe more boat time, which all adds up to more money and more complications. So that was our problem. We wanted more water samples, but we didn't wanna spend money on it. So we had to come up with a solution for that problem. Uh, so what we did is we turned to the Advanced Manufacturing and Design Lab or AMDL. Clearly, we like our acronyms. Um, this is at AOML, and we take advantage there of those technologies I mentioned earlier, like 3D printers and laser cutters. Um, we wanted to use the lab to design, prototype, test, and manufacture an automated water sampler to solve that issue I spoke about. We want to collect more samples and not spend a lot more money. Um, there are samplers available out there that you can submerge that are automated, but they cost ten to $20,000. And then you can only put it at one site. Uh, it's, you know, we can't. We can only put it one site at a time. So we wanted to overcome these difficulties with our own own uh, idea. So we needed something that was low cost, so we can make a bunch of them, submersible in the rate uh, in the range of the depth that we actually study in, it's like down to about hundred feet, 
We want it to be able to collect multiple samples and be programmed to do that in advance so we don't actually have to be there when the samples are taken. And we want it to be able to preserve that sample for a delayed recovery. So if weather kicks up and we can't get back to the site, we know our sample is still gonna be sitting there ready for us to pick it up. So we did come up with a solution. It wasn't easy, it went back and forth on planning what we wanted. Um, the, the process was not a straight path by any means. We changed the design a lot, but in the end, what we came up with was, was this subsurface automated water sampler. We call this guy SAS for short. So we hit all our goals pretty much. The SAS costs about $220 to build. So um, even if we wanna build a bunch of them, it's still only a fraction of the cost of more expensive samplers out there. Um, it can be submerged down to about 55 meters uh, and it doesn't leak, which is really important when you have electronics inside of it. Uh, it can collect two water samples at a time um, and they're automated and programmed in advance so we don't have to be on site. And it uses a remote control to program it. So if you mess up, you can actually program it underwater. Um, you just have to waterproof your remote. And finally, it uses a specialized sample bag with a stabilizing agent. So it prevents this water chemistry inside that water sample from changing so that the samples we collect look the same as when they were collected as when we have them back in the lab and are ready to analyze them. So we had the SAS solution. Now we needed to apply it to real research conditions to see if it worked. So we took it aboard the RV and Jari um, down to Dry Tortugas National Park. Uh, if you're not familiar, Dry Tortugas is a remote site off the tip of the Florida Keys, has some beautiful reefs down there. Um, and the coral program at AOML surveys those reefs every two years for NOAA's National Coral Reef Monitoring Program. We carried out our normal surveys while we were there and we deployed sensors, but we also deployed four of our SAS. Um, because we had four, we were able to collect a water sample every three hours for 24 hours. Um, then we would dive on the SAS, we would replace the bags, we'd collect the full ones, put in empty ones, and the samples would just keep being collected. So we did that for three days, took the SAS back, took the samples back to our lab and analyzed them and compared them to the other sensors we had out. And it worked, great news, it worked well. Um, in fact, it worked so well that we brought them on the next trip that we went on to the Dry Tortugas with Anjari um, just last year. And now the SAS has become a normal part of the National Coral Reef Monitoring Program's carbonate budget surveys. So we came up with a solution and we tested it out. And now we're applying it to our own research. Um, actually, right now, they're being used at Flower Garden Bank's National Marine Sanctuary in the Gulf of Mexico, which is really exciting. Unfortunate that we're not all there diving since it's an amazing reef, but Excited to be here talking to you guys too. So we wanted to make sure that the SAS design wasn't just for our research, but for everybody's, that open source idea. So we published the design and with that publication, we included the code and any validation tests so other people could look to that and use the SAS. We also made a website to give people an easy guide to build their own SAS. And we even added some lesson plans for people who wanted to learn more about ocean chemistry and how to design water samplers. At this point, the SAS has been applied to 13 research projects that we know of in six different countries. So it's really exciting to see it take off as an open source idea that other people are starting to use for their own research too. And now once you get the bug, you kind of want to keep creating solutions to your problems rather than buying stuff off the shelf. So um, the next thing we did was we created a subsurface automated sampler for eDNA that we called the SASE. Um, we also created automated feeders for the experimental aquariums that we have at University of Miami. Um, we wanted to standardize the feeding of our coral in the tanks there, but also do it at night. And we didn't want to come in at night. So we came up with this system. We also designed an automated incubation chamber and water sampler so that we could rapidly study and compare coral fitness and growth at the lab. Now at HUI, I'm just starting to work on projects using two custom-made tools. One of them is the ARS, the Acoustic Reef Recorder System. And what it is, it helps supplement reef restoration efforts by simulating a soundscape of a healthy coral reef trying to attract coral to the area so that they settle there. Uh, the other system is called Medusa, and it's a real-time acoustic recording system that monitors coral reefs for changes in their soundscape, uh, with the idea being that it's an alternate means of doing coral health monitoring. So in case you guys couldn't tell, I'm pretty hooked on on this development of solutions for our problems here. It's been really fun and rewarding, and it has definitely improved the quality and scope of the research that I've been a part of. So now it's your turn. Uh, so I, will, I put this to you, to the audience here, you should go out and try to be a maker, be an inventor, a designer, be a problem solver. Uh, use the internet, 
there are a lot of online tutorials to teach you how to code, how to work with electronics. Uh, Adafruit and SparkFun are two great sites where you can buy parts or you can just use their online tutorials and they're really helpful to learn how to do these things. Um, there's some CAD, where, CAD software out there where you can use their free education accounts to get access and start learning how to use CAD. And they have lots of tutorials that can help out with that too. So you can learn how to digitally design anything. So that's the end of my presentation. I wanted to thank all of you for taking the time to, to join and listen to my talk today. Um, I hope I help push some of you in the direction of coming up with your own solutions to engineering challenges. But I also want to take a moment to acknowledge that none of the projects I've worked on were me alone. It would not have been possible without collaboration and guidance and inspiration from our entire team um, at AOML and on the new projects I'm working on at HUI. So I uh, just wanted to give a shout out to all these people I had pictured here as, as collaborators on all these projects. Um, and with that, if we have time, I'm happy to take any questions, talk about any of the pictures or go back, whatever you like. Yeah, absolutely. Nate, thank you so much for sharing your work with us. We're going to transition over to the Q&A portion, as you mentioned, of today's presentation. Uh, so if anyone has questions, feel free to write them in the chat box, and we'll go ahead and uh, ask them on your behalf. Sure. Should I stop um, sharing too, Brian? Is that a good time to? Yeah, that's fine. Um, so while our attendees are writing questions in the chat, um, I, I have a question for you. Um, sure. Is there something that you're currently working on in your new position that's particularly exciting for you? Or is there something in the pipeline that you just can't wait to get started on? Yeah, well, the, the project that I mentioned before, um, the acronym is a working acronym. I choose to pronounce it as ours. It's, a, it's really exciting because it's, it's a novel uh, idea where we're trying all sorts of ways to restore coral reefs. They've got a lot of challenges, ocean acidification, uh, ocean warming, two major challenges to coral surviving. Um, and coral restoration is a great way to not necessarily fix the problem, but to, to buy us a lot of time so that the coral reefs can survive until humanity kind of gets their act together to fix the oceans. But it's not a, it's not a perfect solution. It's, it, we're doing everything we can to make it more effective. And this idea that maybe we can create a more inviting environment for coral to settle and, and settle naturally, um, if it works, will really help scale up coral restoration to an ecosystem size solution. Right now, it requires somebody to go out and just put coral on the reef one at a time. If you could get a big group of people, that'll work. This is instead taking the natural larvae that are already in the water and having them settle in ideal locations that could really use it, in theory. It, it might not work, but that's part of science, right? It's testing out these ideas and then seeing if they work. And if they do, run with it. If they don't, well, we'll veer off somewhere else. That's exactly right. Thank you so much. Our next question is from Doug, who asks, is coral coming back? Um, it, it depends. Some, some locations are more promising than others. It's, I mentioned those two big uh, issues, ocean acidification and warming. But coastal pollution is a major issue, too. Um, and so in some ways, that's a lot easier to tackle because you're on a more local level. Ocean warming has a lot of atmospheric and global issues. Same thing with acidification, but, but coastal pollution is something we can actually tackle locally. And where people are doing that, um, they are seeing benefits to the coral reefs. Um, there's a lot of other research going on that's trying to find a way to grow stronger coral. Um, and there's been some success there as well. Uh, all hope is not lost. Coral is one of, are one of the most resilient organisms in the ocean when they have a chance to recover. Once we take away the stressors, it's incredible how quickly they can come back. But if those stressors don't go away, then it's, it's they, what they call what? Death by a million cuts, right? It's just stress after stress. And eventually the corals start disappearing. So uh, Flower Garden Banks is one of the most hopeful sites I've ever seen. It's in the middle of the Gulf of Mexico. Most people don't even know there's a reef out there. And it's got the best coral cover I've ever seen in any, any U.S. waters, uh, any, any domestic U.S. waters. Uh, better than anything in the Florida Keys, for sure. It's, it's incredible. So the coral aren't doing bad everywhere. Um, I think the surveys there showed that there was one of the few spots in the U.S. that had growing reefs, so not just reefs that were eroding and going away. Very interesting. Thank you. Uh, Kaylin wants to know how humans are impacting their reefs. Sure. So it's, it's multi, we have a multifaceted approach to our impacts on the reef. Uh, one, of the, one of the big ones, it's kind of a long-term issue, is, is ocean acidification, where we burn fossil fuels. 
um, carbon dioxide goes up into the atmosphere, but when it comes down and mixes with the ocean water, it creates carbonic acid. Um, when that happens, the free hydrogen ions, we're just getting into the chemistry now, but the free hydrogen ions um, mix further with the water to remove uh, carbonate from the water and turn it into bicarbonate. The problem is coral need carbonate to grow. If they don't have as much of it in the water, they can't grow as well. So ocean acidification isn't as much about the ocean being so acidic that everybody's melting. It's more about taking away one of the building blocks that corals use. Uh, ocean warming, we were warming up our atmosphere. We're melting, melting our ice caps to kind of maintain a lot of our, our planetary temperature, right? Our planetary thermostat. Um, and coral are used to a very small range of temperature change. Um, over the last few decades, we've seen those temperature changes fluctuate a lot more. Um, with that, coral have a harder time surviving. They aren't used to all that change. Uh, and the idea is adapt or die. And, and in some cases, coral are able to survive all right. And the last part is that coastal pollution that I was talking about. Not so much like your wrapper that you threw in the ocean. It's not good for a sea turtle, but it doesn't necessarily apply as much to, to a coral reef. Um, it's more about the things that leach into the water from our septic systems or from the runoff that comes out of our cities. Uh, it, it can literally poison, poison the reef by being a chemical or maybe by adding too many nutrients so that algae gets a real big boost and coral can't compete with algae anymore. And once they get grown over by the algae, coral, even though they're an animal, they actually depend on sunlight to survive through a, a symbiotic relationship they have. Um, and if they can't get to the sun, they lose their major source of energy. And a lot of times they end up dying as a result of it. So those are probably the three biggest ways humans are impacting it. Since I went into that, the things you can do to help, right? You can try to reduce your own carbon footprint, find ways to live uh, a less wasteful life that, um, you know, reduce, reuse, recycle. Those sound like cliches, but those mantras are there on purpose. They're really useful, useful ways to reduce your own impact. Um, yeah, those are a couple, couple easy ones that we can attack individually, which is, which is nice. Awesome. I love the call to action. Thank you, yeah. Nate. Um, just, we're going to switch things up just a little bit, focus less on coral and more about you. So our Denali and her middle school students would like to know what inspired you to study marine biology in the first place? Um, I, uh, so I was born down in Puerto Rico and started swimming when I was like two years old, really excited about the water. Um, excited about the beach. I, I never really looked through a mask when I was little to see what was in the water, but I always enjoyed water. Um, as a function of that, when it came time to choose what I was going to go to school for, I was finishing up high school. I knew I wanted to do something. Um, I thought that with my interest in water, really general, right? Maybe there was something in marine science for me. Um, and so I went and got scuba certified so that I'd be able to start volunteering in labs and helping out with field work. And when I started scuba diving was where I really appreciated uh, more of an interaction with the ocean rather than just being aware of its existence um, and seeing those incredible habitats down there with these coral reefs, and animals everywhere. It was really like going to another planet. And it was a really, uh, really impressive experience for me to and kind of kind of push me in that direction further. And as I kept getting pushed in that direction, motivation built and it was kind of a feedback loop of excitement where uh, yeah, but I'd say it started with my, my first experience scuba diving, where I was just really, really got to take my time looking at the, the ocean and what was in it. And even though I'm focused on, I've been focused on coral reefs, my enthusiasm really is, is pretty all encompassing for the ocean. It's not, it's not merely for coral. It's just something that's worked out really well as a study subject for me in, in research. Um, next, up we have, <laughs> next up, we have Zabdil, who wants to know how you are hoping your engineering design will help scientists around the world. So one of the things that we've said in the past for, for some of the engineering projects we've had is that we wanted to democratize science, um, not because we're, you know, science is some evil, evil genius trying to keep out all these outsiders. It's just that a lot of this stuff costs money. Um, a lot of the equipment costs money. And that can be uh, exclusive. It can keep people out of the game. If we can come up with some nice solutions to let people do their research, not just in general, but also better um, while keeping the price low, then that's going to help kind of reach that goal of democratizing science and giving, making it more available to everyone. And on top of that, if more people are doing science, it's like the idea of crowdsourcing. The more people that can do science, the more numbers you generate, the more data you generate, and the, the better you're solutions are going to be because they're based on, on more data. 
So we're trying to expand the scope of the research being done and expand the scope of the people that are, that are able to, to do it. Excellent. Uh, next up, we have Sean, who's curious, what exactly is eDNA and what kind of information does it tell us? Yeah, I, I kind of glossed over a lot of stuff there. So eDNA is environmental DNA. Um, in this case, I'm talking about what's in the ocean, but it could be any environmental DNA from any organism. It could be the, the scales or the mucus that come off of a fish. Um, it could be the microscopic plankton in the water. Um, it, yeah, just about anything. When you sneeze, you could analyze that. That could be eDNA. Um, in this case, though, what it does is it filters water. So it uses the, a similar water sampling, sampling technology to, to pump water through a filter. That filter catches any of the particulates. And then we're able to break those down to just their DNA um, and then use primers to identify where that DNA came from. Um, the molecular science is actually something that I have not been uh, super involved in. And I was more involved in the, uh, the creation of the tool. But the idea is that without actually seeing an organism, you can tell that it had been there. And maybe you can compare the amount of DNA that you collect from different animals to figure out proportionally how they line up, how much of them are in the, in the environment there. It's really useful for a survey method, but it's also great for, for monitoring invasive species um, or for looking for cryptic species, things you can't find easily, or monitoring for endangered animals, things that you, they're endangered because there's, there's not a lot of them left, right? So the chance of seeing them are slim, but the chance of detecting them in the water is, is better. So eDNA is a really exciting molecular tool that people are using for, for marine research um, through a few different directions. It's really fascinating, thank you. Um, Eric is wondering what your favorite part of your job is and if it's the design process, field work, lab work, or even something else. Yeah, but it's always gonna be the field work. That's what got me excited <laughs> about marine science in the first place. Um, but I think, if I were to redo my life and by pure chance, I ended up engineering solutions, I probably would still be pretty happy present day. Maybe not quite as happy without getting to go in the water as much um, because there's a lot of rewarding, uh, constant, constant steps of reward in the process of engineering where you overcome a hurdle and make something work. And there's always another one, but you get a small moment of joy where you realize you fixed something and made it, made it happen. Um, with research, it can be a little bit of a longer payout where you go out and you survey and you get some data, but you need next year's data too, and then maybe two more years of data. And so that process can be, can be a much longer reward process where you see the fruits of your labor. Um, but if the fruits of your labor are gathered in the Caribbean underwater, it's, it's pretty easy pill to swallow. Well, we have time for just one or two more questions. So our next one is, we've heard you have some field work, uh, sorry, field research happening currently at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. Can you tell us a little bit about that project? Yeah, sure. So the, um, the project that I'm working on now, in fact, I was supposed to be working on it today, but it ended up raining, um, <laughs> is a pile driving noise study. So the motivation for it is there's a lot of uh, offshore wind power that people are, are pushing for to establish a cleaner form of energy. One of the impacts though, when you put in a, a massive windmill in the middle of the ocean is that you need to stabilize it. To do so, you drive huge piles, like way bigger than telephone poles into the, into the sea floor. And the impacts of you know, the noise impacts, the vibrations of, of establishing these are, are massive. You would not wanna be swimming around there, it would, it would hurt you. So the, the question then is what's it doing to the marine environment? So we're trying to quantify that on a smaller scale so that we can kind of extrapolate that information for, for policy managers and for, for uh, people planning out those, those energy projects. Um, so what we're doing is driving a pile into an area by the docks in Woods Hole up here in Massachusetts. Um, and in the water, we have a bunch of cages with different kinds of animals and we're monitoring them with video cameras to measure responses. Um, we're also doing physiological measurements where we're looking at um, it's called their AEP, their auditory evoked potential, where they're looking at how physiologically do they respond to a loud noise? And if they're exposed to loud noises for a long time, do they stop responding, which can maybe have an impact on, on how quickly they get eaten by a predator or how well they respond to other threats in life. So we're trying to establish how much of an impact is occurring to these animals. Um, another thing we're doing is just generally, does it make an unpleasant environment that they don't like? We have baited underwater cameras, um, which I actually put together when I got here, just knowing that they existed, we were able to craft our own, own BR, BRUV rig. Um, and we established those at sites 
at further distances from where the pile driving was occurring. So they can we look at are more fish hanging around the pile driving? Are they further away? Do they not seem to care? Um, so yeah, there's a lot going on with this one experiment right now, but it's really exciting to know that what we're trying to do is in, inform a very functional thing, right? We want clean energy. What's the cost of establishing these clean energy sites? Are there ways that we can mitigate those impacts so that they're not as bad? Um, are there animals we should be more worried about than others? And that's what we're trying to come up with the answers for right now. Very cool and such important work. Thank you. Uh, we have time for one more question. And this one is, um, I know we have several student groups in attendance today. So what advice would you give them if they were interested in marine research or conservation? Um, don't, don't wait, get it, get out there, especially conservation. You can, you can be active in, in real time with that. Um, so you can start on your personal level. You can motivate your families to be better. I, I know I can always come up with better ways to live my life, to try to reduce my impacts a little bit more. Um, there's lots of solutions to try to be part of the solution there. But, uh, but there's also a lot of organizations you can get involved in to, to try to help out and lend your time in that respect. If research is also something you're interested in, um, experience is a huge, huge plus. Education is really important. You do need math. You do need science. You, um, you, know, you need these skill sets, but experience is where you apply them. Maybe you don't like marine science and you just thought you did. It's really important that you try it out and see. Um, so any opportunities that are available. When I, when I first started, I, I mentioned how I got scuba certified. That was part of what I knew I would need for a marine science degree. But I also volunteered in an aquarium. I thought that'd be fun to, to see how I like aquarium work and, and get familiar with some of the animals down there. Um, and they didn't pay me, but it was, it was a great experience for me. And I ended up working in another aquarium. Uh, I ended up volunteering on a couple of research cruises. Usually you don't pay for them, but you don't get paid either. So it's a, it's a free time that you're dedicating to the effort, but totally worth it. You learn more about yourself, you learn more about your interests, and you add to your resume, and that makes you stand out from everybody else. And like, oh, this guy just finished high school and has a research project in, could be your hometown, but it shows that you were interested and that you started trying early on to see if it's, you know, to try it out and see what you like. Well, Nate, it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you and learn from you. So thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate you joining us this morning. Yeah, no, it was my, my pleasure too. I hope everybody enjoyed the talk. I'm going to turn things over to Stephanie to wrap up today's event. Thank you, Brian. And thanks, Nate, so much for such an exciting and engaging talk today. You can tell how passionate you are about what you do. Um, if you'd like to take a look at the K-12 extension activities and resources that we've curated uh, related to this topic, you can do so. Find that along with the recording of today's talk on the UF Earth Systems YouTube channel. And we ask that you please take a moment to complete the survey link that you can see here on your screen. It's also been placed in the chat box for you. Um, regarding our next event remaining this fall, Ocean Expert Exchange Series, we'll hope that you'll join us on November 9th where we'll have Dr. Kelly Kibler of the University of Central Florida, who will be sharing her eco-hydraulics work and talking about using um, natural coastal infrastructure like mangrove forests and oyster reefs for climate adaptation along Florida's coastline. So we hope to see you there and we hope that you have a wonderful rest of your week. Thanks everyone and have a great day. Bye-bye.